you do it alternate years because it's very depleting of nutrients in the soil. And so you really, to do it successfully, is you have to give that soil a year off to try to like with another crop to replenish the nutrients. Um, so that's really the main reason is, but the, the deer just eat them most. Like the one time that we had it a couple years ago, we had some success with them. We had to put like scarecrows and pie pans and fishing line. Like it, it looked ugly for a while, but it was the only way to keep the deer out for at least a little while. Mm -hmm. But I got great pictures of the sunflowers. Yeah. So the, yeah, the, there were sunflowers out in front of the barn here years ago, and then the um, the project that I'm going to talk about here with the gardens came about, and so it's kind of better ecologically because it's more diverse. Um, and some people gave us a little flack because some flowers may not be considered natives and things like that. So we have all a bunch of natives now in this area. So yeah. So and then the sunflowers would bloom for like a short period, and then it was gone. Well, now we have this garden area out front, and there's something blooming all the time. here I've been at the park since the beginning of this project the garden project and I've seen the transformation I've got pictures in here too of the transformation and it's I feel really old after a while like I'm like looking back I was like oh because you'll see like kids in the photos and like a lot of the kids are rocked by kids I'm like oh they were just little things and now they're like almost tall as me six o'clock we may have some other people wander in this is Stephanie Bowler Mueller, as in Mueller, Mueller, and she's been at the uh, Seven Islands Park since 2017, and she is going to show some of the history and some of the different things and changes that they've made, and um, she's got a lot of very interesting things to show us, and I'm sure we'll have more questions to ask, so I will turn the program over to Stephanie. All right, great. Uh, thank you for having me. I enjoy getting out of the park. Um, I would say out of the office, but I really don't stay much in an office. I, I like to sort of be outside. Um, but what I'm going to talk about tonight is one of our big projects. It's a big part of our park because it kind of ties in a lot of what we are about at Seven Islands. We are all about the birds, but we're also about native plants. And everyone loves flowers and, and pollinators. And so this garden area, we call it our Wild Yards Garden, is at the very front entrance of the park. It's the first thing people see when they come to our park. And I, I like it because it kind of ties in what we are all about. And um, I'm gonna kind of go through a little history of it because it hasn't always been at the park. Um, so for those of you that may not know where Seven Islands is, uh, we are, if you go up from here, go up 60, Highway 66, and we're kind of before the interstate, you follow the French Broad River. We are surrounded by the French Broad River on three sides, so we're a peninsula. So when people call and say that they're lost, I kind of wonder about them. Uh, I tell them, you should just keep walking. You're gonna hit the parking lot. Um, but uh, we are, you know, uh, just up the road, you could say. But here is a trail map of our park. Uh, we've got about 10 miles of trail, so it's not just for birds. A lot of people come to our park uh, for, uh, just hiking, families come with their bikes and scooters and things like that. We've got a lot of just dog walkers, a lot of photographers coming um, these days. We've got some picnic tables and things like that. We do have some original structures to the property, like some barns, so the uh, historic barns. There's um, two houses still on the property as well. And we even have an outdoor classroom up in the woods uh, that was built during COVID by some Girl Scouts using some locally resourced um, materials as well. So, um, and we do own 40 acres on the other side of the river called Mutton Hollow Landing. We joke that that's the dark side because there's literally nothing over there except the parking lot and a boat launch. Um, so uh, all, all the shenanigans seem to happen over there. Uh, but uh, if you had been to the park years ago, so we became a state park in 2014. So we were, we were the baby of the park system for a while. Uh, but 
prior to that, it had been managed as a wildlife refuge by Knox County Parks and Legacy Parks Foundation um, and the Seven Islands Foundation. So from 2002 to 2013-ish, it was kept as a wildlife refuge, but it was like in a transformation period. We It had historically been farmland, dairy cattle, um, that was raised by the Kelly family. And then at the, uh, the end of the park, near the tip of the peninsula was the Cresswell family. And the Cresswells made their living by dredging sand out of the river and pulling it up onto land and then selling the sand. Uh, that sandy soil also made growing conditions for watermelons and cantaloupes and tomatoes and things like that. So they had um, some other uh, businesses as well. Um, but so, if you imagine, most of the 416 acres was fescue and things like that, and some forests. Um, but fescue fields are not the greatest ecologically, you might official for wildlife. They're great for cows, if you have cows, or some other, um, you know, farm animals. But in terms of birds and things like that, we, there was a lot of work to be done. So we did a lot of mowing and disking and burning and planting with native warm season grassland, plant seeds and other wildflowers and things like that. So eventually it has become the great place that it is, but we kind of had a blank canvas for a while when we were trying to decide what to do with stuff. So this area is our front entrance area, which looks a lot different now, as you'll see, but it was just, you know, open areas very little there and then if you went behind that barn it was just mud and dirt and you know a couple little paths and stuff gravel paths not really much to look at so we treated this as a blank canvas and we're like, what can we do to benefit the wildlife the pollinators and the park visitors and the birds like everyone and we're like what better way than to plant a native plant garden like so all native plants so the, the pollinators will be happy, the birds will be happy because they'll be eating the, the pollinators, and then the people will be happy because it'll be pretty, you know, and photographers will be happy. So uh, we, we came up with this game plan, um, but then people were like, well, they may not understand why we really focus on native plants. And if you've never been a gardener or things like that, um, so these are some of the common things that we stress to people about why plant native plants? Well, there's usually lower maintenance involved with them once they get established because they're used to the growing conditions in that area. So you're not gonna have to water them as much. They know how much water is gonna tip, rain's gonna typically come. Um, they know what the soil conditions are typically like. You don't typically have to fertilize them after they get established. They're used to the, the pests, you know, the pollinators in the area. So you really don't, shouldn't have to use pesticides on them. Um, and so you might have to mulch it, you know, to keep the moisture in the soil and stuff like that. But for the most part, there's, you know, less maintenance required for them. And then you know, those green spaces are, these days you're hearing about reducing air pollution and increasing um, oxygen and things like that. But then, as I was saying, by planting these native plants, you're gonna attract those native bugs, which then are gonna attract those native birds, which are then are gonna attract all sorts of other wildlife. So it's really promoting biodiversity. And it's pretty. Everyone loves to, to, to see pretty things and escape. So this was our initial sketch that we had made of the plan, the blueprint. Uh, it was done by Overhill Gardens out of Von Orr. They're a, a native plant nursery. And so this big red square in the middle, that's our barn, that, that entrance barn and there's pathways throughout and there's different trees and shrubs and you know moist soil areas and uh, herbaceous pollinator gardens and so all sorts of stuff that all blooms at different times of the year and this looks pretty impressive well we would have been insane to try to do all that at one time uh it, was, it would have been too much work to do at one time plus money doesn't grow on trees and a garden like that is going to cost a lot of money especially if you're doing it with native plants so we had a plan but then we're like well who's going to pay for it so um if anyone has seen these like tennessee state park license plates around uh the, we call them the blue flag iris plates 
when you purchase that plate, a portion of that money goes to state parks to fund projects like this, this garden project. Um, and so we were able to pull some money from the, the license plate fund, but then also our friends group, the Friends of Seven Islands, does a lot of fundraising for us for causes like this. Um, and so it's been a project over the last six years. We've kind of done it in installments. Um, so initially it was a lot of digging, planting, and then repeating. Um, and this person right here in the green, if you've ever been to our park and met Justine, our park manager, that's her, and that's a rare photo of her in the field because she usually does not do field work. Uh, she's usually in the office, but uh, it was a lot of bare kind of area for a while and a lot of planting. Uh, we were, you know, we worked with a lot of volunteers. Uh, so if anyone is interested at the end of this, I haven't scared you off and you want to come to the park and help us. Uh, I've got my card up here. Uh, so a lot of volunteers helped us with the planting and the mulching and things like that to, to really bring it all together. Uh, and then there's always mulch. Uh, I just read a big load of mulch this weekend and there will be more Memorial Day weekend. So are interested in getting some hours in, come the Monday weekend. We will have lots more mulch. But by mulching an area, you hold in the moisture in the ground, and so it kind of also then less watering. To add that mulch breaks down, it will add nutrients into the soil. And a load of fresh mulch on something makes it look so much nicer, like prettier. And um, so it's it's kind of a little bit of hard work in the beginning, but as you can see, my daughter can do it barefoot and. Too. Yes, it does. Yes. Yeah, I smelled a lot of mulch. Uh, so again, like once you get them established, they don't require much watering, but getting them, if you're planting new plants like that, they kind of need a little bit of a boost um, in the beginning. So uh, lots of watering in the beginning. For a while, it looks like we have a flag garden, you know, because there's flags everywhere because we don't necessarily know like what's a plant and what's a weed and where some things is so when we put in a new installment you'll see lots of flags and then you'll usually see my children watering uh, i pay them with pizza and ice cream and, yeah. um, but uh, so and then the pathways through the garden area if you come out to our park you'll notice it's not concrete it's actually called flexi pave it's made out of recycled uh rubber tires and a uh pea gravel and then a bio glue uh, like a binder and so all those things mixed together kind of make this semi hard surface that has a little bit of give to it and so it kind of flexes with weather conditions and it let allows water rainwater to permeate through it so to basically it also kind of cleans the rainwater as it filters through too so it, it is a hard surface um, to make it ADA compliant. So it is ADA compliant, but then we also added some uh, gravel on the sides to, to slope it down a little bit. So it's not a sheer drop off. Um, but it, it was, you know, again, work up front, but now it's great and very little maintenance with those uh, flexi pave paths. But uh, they're nice, but they're expensive and they're very messy to put in. Like I ruined a couple pairs of pants with that blue binder but they're super nice, super ecologically friendly materials. And uh, if, you, if you install it correctly, it lasts a long time. Some areas were done by contractors, which weren't done correctly and they're coming apart. But um, and this is a photo of me like in my early days before they actually started paying me. This is like my volunteer days, uh, which makes me feel really old when I see that. But, um, and then for a while, like I said, sometimes it looks like we have a flag garden. So some of the times when we did installments, it would look like that. And the deer would just treat it like a buffet. And so we had to put, we had to get creative. So we had to put some fencing around and uh, fishing line and flagging. And it, it, it brought up some good conversations with people when they were like, what is going on here? And they come up with some funny stories. But eventually once they get established, it fills in and they can fend for themselves. And we, we take the fencing down. You could have told them the new body part. Right. 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 Exactly. Yeah. 
So, and then if you were to come out now, well, the zinnias aren't there now, but the trees and the shrubs and the flower beds, it's just gorgeous. Right, right now we've got several of the trees that are in bloom um, and several of the flowers are blooming. Um, the zinnias, that, that big patch of zinnias we've done for the last two or three years, but we're, we're gonna do a different wildflower, like a native wildflower through there this year. Um, the photographers have kind of ruined it for us, for many people, because they trample the flowers and pose their clients lying down wherever they want. And yeah, they pay for it later though, because the ticks and the chiggers are all in there. <laughs> they're like, aren't you gonna write them a ticket? I'm like, they're gonna have their payback. <laughs> they're, they're, they're gonna have their own consequences. <laughs> Uh, so we'll, we'll get nice uh, areas like this out front. We got lots of cone flowers and asters and um, different types of mint. We have like a mountain mint. We have a agastache or a, or like hyssop is what another name for it. Uh, we get this really pretty um, showy showy St. John's wort, uh, sort of sunburst variety. It looks like little you know puffs of sun. Uh, the purple cone flowers, the like echinacea, all this stuff is blooming at different times of the, the year and it's just, you can hear the whole garden buzzing and then you see all the birds fluttering around and things like that. It's just, you know, you don't even have to go very far into the park to really get you know, a good nature experience. Um, the bird feeders, you'll see bird feeders throughout the, the gardens and bird houses. Uh, they were all donated or purchased. Some of them were donated, some of them were purchased through our friends group, but from Wild Birds Limited. And they actually donate the food though for us, for these feeders um, throughout the winter and spring. Um, and these birdhouses and most of these like bigger hopper style feeders are made out of recycled plastic. So um, if you're looking for like feeders or birdhouses for your own property, they're gonna last a while and kind of be more ecologically friendly. Um, this recycled plastic uh, kind of route is really great, but they're a little bit more pricey, but then again, you don't have to replace them as much because they're gonna last longer. Um, so we've got uh, different types of feeders and actually the boxes by the barn, we actually now have nest cameras in. And so we've been able to like use cameras to see like when bluebirds and tree swallows are coming into the boxes and laying eggs and having their babies. And so we're gonna be sharing some of those um, videos or photos soon. It's pretty fun. Um, but then we also have um, these really nice interpretive signs that kind of tie in how those plants and birds are like interacting with each other. Um, these signs were all designed by Robin Easter Designs in Knoxville. And we've got other signs inside of the barn too that are made by the same um, design firm. But it kind of ties it all in together. Like what's our purpose? Why are these plants here? You know, they're not just a pretty flower. There's a lot of ecological benefit to them. Um, right now the coral honeysuckle, that red honeysuckle is in full bloom and it is just gorgeous. The hummingbirds love it. The bees love it. It's our native honeysuckle. Um, the bee balm, the scarlet bee balm will probably bloom later in the summer. The New England asters usually bloom in the fall and the purple cone flowers will bloom this summer and things like that. But we do a lot of programming in the, in the gardens as well. Um, but it's just, oh, just all sorts of colors. Um, Excuse me. Yeah. I know it's not a flower, but do you plant any milkweed? We do. Yeah. We, at our park, we have several types of milkweed. We have common milkweed, we have butterfly milkweed, we have swamp milkweed, and we have the climbing milkweed vine as well. So we yeah. have a lot of it. That's what I'm on our butterfly. On our butter, yep, yeah. yep. Absolutely. Um, so I kind of like did some slides here based on like different color themes. So we got, you know, lots of Coreopsis, these giant cone flowers, not only are like the seed, the flower heads real like about the size of my hand, but the stalks are five, six feet tall too. Um, they are giant. Um, but we've got gray-headed coneflowers. The, the yellow jessamine is a real pretty vine that grows along some fence uh, fences as well. And then these fireworks goldenrod 
are just phenomenal. It's just like bursts of yellow, um, and people just love them. And those are usually later in the summer. They're not blooming right now. And then we get into our purples and violets um, in, in our, some of our little lower like ditch areas where it's moister soils. We have our our irises. Um, right now, the fringed blue star, gray sedge, blue false indigo, and wisteria are in full bloom right now. They're all in bloom. And the wisteria is just, it covers the whole backside of the barn. And it's just gorgeous. Um, and the, the blue false indigo is just like, it just fills out nicely and it's just, oh, it's just amazing. Oh, and the, the I have a question stars are pretty too. about the wisteria. Mm -hmm. So I've heard that it can be invasive. It can it can be a little. We have to kind of rein it in every year. Like it, it starts to creep, and we have to kind of trim it back every year. But this there are two types of wisteria, but this is our native one, so it's smaller blooms as well. Like whereas sometimes along the highways you'll see the the invasive the non-native one which has much bigger blooms. These are, yeah, I would say each bloom is probably like the size of the palm of my hand. They're really small compared to those other ones. But it does, like any vine, um, even like the coral honeysuckle or native honeysuckle, it, if you let it go, it will go, but it's, you know, you kinda gotta rein it back in sometimes. Um, but that's the nature of a vine. Uh, and then we have a lot of grasses. Uh, Blue-eyed grasses are blooming right now. Uh, the muley grass in late summer, early fall, is just like pink smoke, it looks like, uh, coming from the grasses, and it's really pretty. And then we get these real tall sugar cane plume grasses. Um, it, it's just kind of fitting since we are a predominantly grassland park. But all these things are attracting all sorts of different birds, too, so, and pollinators. So it's, it's kind of a win-win. Uh, hot lips, so the baby sage, it looks like if we gave the flowers lipstick and they, they put it on that's what it looks like uh columbine is blooming right now the fire pink has already bloomed i don't think it's still blooming uh but the choke berries um i think those are later in the summer i do believe uh, but then like i said the pollinators uh certain times of the year just it's just you can hear the buzzing the pollinators are so happy we've got our, our native bees, um, which are a lot of like solitary ground nesting bees and things like that. So we've got a lot of uh, native bees. We've got some honey bees as well. We do raise honey bees at the park. Um, but we have an abundance of caterpillars. And these guys are my favorite um, because kids love poop. And <laughs> these, these caterpillars look like bird poop. And if you touch their foreheads, they stick their, um, looks like a tongue. They stick that out, it's called their osmotarium. And they'll stick that out and they'll emit a smell that smells like poop as well. <laughs> I don't know if they taste like poop. I don't, I draw the lines after that. Um, but they turn into the giant swallowtail butterfly. So the, the butterfly itself is like the size of my hand, like everything. It's just amazing. Um, but we have our monarchs, um, we have lots of monarchs, honeybees, bumblebees. Those guys at the top there are snowberry clear wings or hummingbird moths. People look at them, they're like, what is that? They can't tell if it's a moth or if it's a, it, they don't know what it is. And so I have to tell them like, it's a moth, but it just looks weird, it's weird. Um, but we have lots of little skippers and things like that. They're just happy as can be. This is a shot, I, I took this with my cell phone. I don't know how I ever got this lucky. Uh, Crimson Clover is what this bloom is and it's blooming right now. And I just happened to get the shot of this honeybee going towards the crimson clover. Um, so I just wanted to share that because wow. yeah, yeah. yeah. I felt right there. Stunning. Yeah. Uh, but what you probably all came here to see was birds because we do a lot of bird banding uh, since we are a bird park. And we get a lot of valuable information from bird banding. So by having the birds in our hand, we actually then are able to take a lot of measurements from them. We, we put a very unique band on their legs um, you can kind of see the one on that woodpecker up there. Uh, each one has a very unique in individual number, so no other bird in the world will have that band size and the same number. We record all the data, submit it to an international database, and when we, we or anybody else catches that bird again, they can look it up and see 
how old that bird is, where was it caught, has it migrated somewhere else, uh, has it shown any signs of breeding. So you get all these different insights into their productivity and survivorship. Um, we just did bird banding on Sunday and we caught a, I believe it was a common yellow throat warbler at our park that we originally banded at our park in 2016. It was a seven year old little warbler and they're migratory so they don't stay here year round. They go to the tropics and they come back to our park. Like bird feeding and needs in the office. <laughs> <laughs> so we get a lot of chickadees, a lot of goldfinches, woodpeckers, um, are really cute and fun to look at, but they do not like to be held. I will tell you that. It's like holding a jackhammer with a needle, like in your hand. And yeah. Uh, but you, I wanted to show the red bellied woodpecker because people always call them red headed woodpeckers because you see the red mohawk on their head. And I, there is a red headed woodpecker, but it's different. And so I wanted to show this because you can see the peachy red on its belly, how it got its name. Um, we get lots of tufted tip mice as well. They also do not like to be held. They're, they're biters. Um, but then we have uh, the fox sparrows usually here in the winter. Uh, Eastern towhee, that's a female, so it's brown instead of black. Uh, but towhees, I love towhees. Here, here's an indigo bunting. Uh, this is a male, the males are pretty bright blue. The females are just drab brown and camouflage. Uh, brown thrashers are just strong birds. Like they're big and strong and they do exactly that. They, they thrash. They, they, they do not like to hold still. Um, Sorry, but that's okay. <laughs> um, and, but then what people really like to see is the hummingbirds. So we do get hummingbirds this time of year and they'll stay here through the summer. We'll feed them. Um, if people aren't aware, you can set up your own feeders. You can make your own sugar water. You don't have to buy the stuff at the store. It's a simple four to one ratio, four cups of water, one cup of sugar. Just dilute it, it's good to go. Uh, you, but you don't, when it starts to get cloudy, that's a good time to change it because then it starts to ferment and then drunk hummingbirds are just, <laughs> I mean, the hummingbirds might not be complaining, but um, the males will get these pretty red gorgeous feathers on them. Um, but that, that up there in the corner, you can see the little numbers. We band them and it's almost just like aluminum foil with numbers printed on them. And again, no two hummingbirds are gonna have the same uh, number, but it's just, even the pliers that we use are like different for these guys compared to the other songbirds and things. And everything is just a micro, it's like real small, yes. Do you use a different warming system for each type of bird? Yeah, so the different birds have different band sizes, just like yeah. all people don't have the same ring sizes and things like that. The birds will have different band sizes based on their their leg sizes. And typically certain species will fall into different categories. So we have a book, we call it our Bird Banders Bible, and it's got every species in North America and what size band they'll take. But, we not, also, but the numbering system is different. The number it's usually it's usually about nine numbers uh, in a series, but they're all sequential. Okay. But no two birds with the same band size are gonna have the same number. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you can I ask one more yeah. question Mark, related to that? Do you uh, like track them with around the country, different places? Is there like so with our banding data, if one of the birds were to be caught somewhere else and the data recorded, we would get an alert. Uh, has that happened? It's only actually happened with owls. We we banned sawbud owls in the winter and we banded three of them a couple years ago and last fall one of them was actually caught in Canada at a banding station near um, I don't know if it was Lake Erie or Lake Ontario uh, somewhere up in Canada um, but a banding station caught the same owl that we banded we, we caught it as a youngster in Seven Islands one winter and then it flew up to Canada to breed and it got caught there and so they sent us pictures and like the data and it was just fascinating but normally we don't actually get a lot of like recaptures from other stations of our birds, but we get recaptures a lot from our own birds. Um, 
but it could happen. But yeah, there is like an, an alert system. But the new project we're starting is called Modus, where we put little geolocator like tracking tags on them, like a backpack. Uh, we're only going to do it on certain bird species that we have like a project. We want to find out more about their habitat use or dispersal. Uh, so it, it entails basically putting up with this big radio antenna uh, tower on one of our barns. And if a bird or bat, because some people are doing bats, bird or bat with those uh, little tags, like GPS tags, come near radio tags, come near or within a certain distance of our radio tower, it picks it up. And we've actually had hits um, that it's picked up like three birds that were migrating from Canada down to the tropics, like Swainson's thrushes and I think there was a white-throated sparrow as well or something that it picked up. But we've had, so we're getting into that field, but it's a lot more expensive. <laughs> so, um, so that will be really cool when we start getting into that field, but like, we'll be able to see like live almost like where it, if it, when it gets picked up by other towers mm -hmm. and more people are putting towers up, um, so so yes and no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard stories about leaving bird hummingbird feeders out all winter. Mm -hmm. You can. Um, the problem we run into here is well, with the winters being so unpredictable, um, with it freezing. Yeah. And so I've seen some people put like heat lamps, you know, near their feeders and on a really cold day, or some people just bring them in at night and then they put them back out in the day if it's warm enough. Um, you can, sometimes we will get, um, we won't get the ruby throat hummingbirds here in the winter because they pack their bags and they go south. But sometimes we will get um, uh, rufous hummingbirds that kind of are normally more northern species or northwestern and they'll kind of migrate this way and they'll kind of find people's feeders. There's one a family that's been in North Knoxville Powell area and they've had a Rufus Hummingbird come back every winter just about and we banded it so we know it's the same one. Um, but so you can, you can certainly and you might catch one of those rare ones that kind of are just blown off course in their migration or they come um, you know a little bit further but it's you know a little bit more maintenance because Whippoorwills? We we actually heard one a couple weeks ago at, at our park, um, but I'm usually not out there at night, so I don't usually hear them. But sometimes we do night hikes, but who knows? I don't take one for like every year at my house, and this character just goes on and yeah. on and on. At first, it's real cool, and then you're like, okay, <laughs> 30, 40 times he won't <laughs> shut up. Yeah. Um, I've heard that hummingbirds are attracted to the color red. Mm -hmm. Is your four cup water, one cup sugar, should you? You don't need to put the red dye. The red uh, dye is actually very harmful to them. That's what I thought. Like, yep. Will they, they you can have like a red feeder. Like a lot of the feeders that you find at Walmart, the plastic ones, they'll have red plastic and that's certainly that's fine. Yeah, yeah, that's all you need. Okay. It's just either red plastic on your feeder or red flowers around your feeder. Um, they're really attracted to like the nectar, that, that sugary um, nectar, but no, the, the red dye is very harmful actually. That's why I've never bought store bought no, hummingbird do. feeds. So. No, I cringe, like I just want to like knock it all off the shelf. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so some of our other uh, little friend, feathered friends, uh, the white crown sparrows and, uh, and the white throated sparrows, they actually only come to our park for the winters. They, they come from Canada and they have found our feeders and they love our feeders. And we know that because when we ban them, we look for their fat and they store their fat in like their wishbone area, their neck area called their furcula. And when they get really fat, it's like bulging and they are usually very bulging with fat. And they, like all this time of year, like or spring, they should be migrating back and they usually, they're still like, even this past weekend, there were still some white crown sparrows. Like they don't want to go back. They, they like the food. Um, so does the weather, the way the weather's changed, is that a so That's affecting the them too, yeah. A lot of birds that used to migrate long distances are actually migrating shorter distances because they don't need to. Like why make hundreds of mile journey when you can just go to the next state, like, you know, yeah. shorter distances. Um, Ruby crown kinglets are another one that you'll see just in the winter. Um, a little red, like, mohawk area. Um, song sparrows, you'll see them year-round at our park. Um, they're one of the most common sparrows. Um, 
look pretty, pretty solid. Uh, and then we do a lot of programs, as I mentioned. So I'll do a lot of uh, native plant uh, and flower programs. We'll do monarch tagging in the fall, where we, we catch butterflies. And that, that little round sticker ta tag is a sticker with a, the website, monarchwatch.org. And again, it's a unique number. No two monarchs are gonna have the same tag number. And it's just like the produce stickers you find almost at the store, but like, so super sticky. So lightweight, and it doesn't harm the butterfly at all. And it's not enough weight to really hinder it. Um, and basically what happens is these monarchs will hold on to that sticker and then migrate to the cloud forests of Mexico and go up into the um, OML fir forests in Mexico mountains and then go into like a hibernation stage and those stickers fall off eventually. Um, and then villagers will go, they get paid by the sticker to go collect those stickers and then it adds to research. Like we can then say this, you know, ACHU275 was banded at Seven Islands and it made it all the way to Mexico. So that's data that we didn't know anything about monarchs or like how far they were migrating or how many were making that journey. So through this Monarch Watch program, um, we've been able to find a little bit of more information on this mystery. Because um, monarchs are fascinating because not all mo monarchs migrate. It's every fifth generation of monarchs are the ones that migrate. There's the previous four will go a little bit further south every year, and then that and then they only live a few weeks. But that fifth generation is like the mega generation, and they'll live for several months to make that migration, and then come back. They'll they'll have their babies and then die. But then four generations will go on, and they'll just live a few weeks, and then but that fifth one will always be the migratory one. And we know that because of the stickers, and it's it's a fascinating. Program. But here's this butterfly milkweed, if we were talking about milkweed. So this is another one that we've got, uh, this real pretty one. Um, and then we got in some little playground elements because everyone kept asking when we were gonna get a playground. And so we were like, well, if we're gonna get a playground, we're gonna make it bird themed. And so we've got this giant nest with a, with a seesaw, we call it our tweeter cotter. Um, we've got a little slide and the steps and the platform for the slide are all made out of cedar trees from the park that had to be cut down for like the power companies and stuff. We're like, well, if the power companies are gonna cut down these trees, we're gonna use them. And we made a slide out of them, or the, the steps of the slide, um, by, made by Timberdoodle Playscapes. Uh, and then again, we have volunteers come of all ages, kids, adults, uh, all places to work, uh, the weeds never end, but the, uh, there's always mulching um, and other opportunities too. But um, like I said, we just had a volunteer day this past weekend. We're having another one Memorial Day weekend, but we have them every month. So uh, I got my card up here uh, and then the deer. Everyone loves the deer. Um, the zinnias are not coming back, but the deer will. Um, I think that's all we got. So I'll take any questions. If Yes. Yeah, so, for instance, the the zinnia. Mm -hmm. Now, do you allow people to come in and like deadheads? We do, uh, especially like once. That, yeah, we'll uh, if people know what they're doing, we'll let them deadhead them. If some people like ask, can we take some of the harvest, some of them? We're like, yeah, sure, because we're gonna, um, you know, we'll. In the past, we've replanted them every year, but we're not gonna replant them with zinnias again. Um, but yeah, if people have gardening experience and they know what they're doing, like if they know how to prune bushes or they know how to come on and we will put you to work and I will I will give you full access to the gardens um, if you know what you're doing. If you don't know what you're doing, then I might have to ask you a question. That's um, Sarah. She does our garden club oh, okay. and yes. seed exchange. Okay, well, absolutely. We would love <laughs> to have you. My card is up here. And anytime you want to bring people out or know that know what they're doing, I would gladly have you. Okay. I'll, I'll provide bottles of water and snacks. <laughs> you know. yeah. If you come often enough, I'll give you a volunteer t shirt. Ooh. I know, right? <laughs> um, and a sticker. Yeah, and there's stickers up here too. I'll give you a sticker.
Yeah. Do you have nothing to do with that Microsoft thing? Uh, we partner with American Eagle Foundation. Um, so we do a lot of programs with them. They'll bring uh, birds of prey out to our park uh, to try to get the birds used to people. So there might be a random day that you come and you're like, why is there an eagle on someone's arm? But they're, they're trying to get birds acclimated to crowds. Um, but we also partner with them as part of the rehabilitation program. They rehabilitate injured birds and sick birds and need somewhere to release them. And so if it's say, um, they've released barn owls, red shoulder hawks, uh, red tailed hawks, and screech owls, and a bald eagle. They've released all those at our park. And we were like, bring it on. We, we will, you can release any bird of prey that's you know native here. We, we don't want like, Have, do you ever do like a sunset walk or anything during the? We do. Uh, some of our most popular programs are sunset hikes and night hikes, where we'll call in owls and things like that. Um, it's really cool when they fly at the ranger's head and the ranger's head. Did you know owls play possum? Yeah. They can, yeah. They do. Yeah. So, night hikes, we're about to post our firefly hikes too. Uh, firefly hikes are really popular because we've got about four species of fireflies at our park, and they are just fascinating to watch. Is it a um, ghost firefly? We don't have the blue ghost, at least we don't think we do. Uh, but we've got the J stroke one that start right at sunset. They kind of like do a J pattern, um, and then we've got the Christmas light uh, fireflies that look like Christmas lights just blinking constantly. And then we've got, I don't know the common name, but they're um, lucicrescents. They, they basically flash and they glow for about a couple seconds and they kind of fade out. And then we've got another one that the firefly expert says she saw that there's like an orange glow to it and she calls those the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> so we, we've got a couple species. We may have the blue ghost, I just, I don't spend that much time in the woods at night alone. Oh, you, you got a gun. I do got a gun. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but again, yeah. The blue ghost fireflies, I have seen them at other parks, and it's very creepy, mm -hmm. like, to see them glowing. Mm -hmm. And they'll glow blue, and then they'll just kind of, like, stay lit and hover up a hillside. And it's, it's very scary. Right when at Elkmont. Yeah, yeah I've, seen them at, I've seen them at Elkmont. I've seen them at Frozen Head. I've seen them at Pickett State Park. I've seen the glow worms there as well, like, but the Rocky Fork has the blue ghosts. Rocky Fork State Park up um, near Flag Pond, uh, near Irwin, they've got the blue ghosts for sure. And I think Edgar Evans State Park has blue ghosts as well. Um, so, when's your next bird banding? Our next bird banding session, our, our next public one. I think it is sold out, but we'll adding we're, we'll be adding more public ones. Our, our next one that we're hold, we we hold them with the staff and volunteers about every two to three weeks. Um, and I'll just say like, typically they're on Sunday morning. Like if you if you just happen to be walking by, like we're not going to turn you away, but you won't be getting the full like programming thing uh, like that you would with a tour. Um, Bird banding. Our next one is May 21st. Our next public one is May 21st. So, uh, but we'll be having them about every, we, we do them about every two weeks or so. Um, so if you, you kind of happen to be walking through a park on a Sunday morning and you see people like walking through fields, like checking the nets, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and you can just come up and say hi and check it out. And, but, um, so that's how you catch the bird? Yeah, so well, how we catch them is we put up these, they're called mist nets. They look like a volleyball net kind of, and there are different layers to them. And we set them up um, on these posts or poles in like mowed or cut out little lane, net lanes we call them. And the birds fly through and don't see them because there's almost like fishnet stockings, like they're real uh, fine mesh uh, netting. And the birds fly in, they lose their momentum and they get tangled. 
and then we go in as trained extractors to untangle the bird. It's like a puzzle sometimes. Um, the, and the puzzle is kind of, you know, calling and biting and pecking at you and it's got sharp claws and very noisy sometimes and cardinals bite with <laughs> a passion. And it, yeah. We have, we have been with those. <laughs> I don't know. There's we always joke with like the staff, like when we get cardinals, we always like we have a wheel, like a bicycle wheel that like we kind of put the birds in the staging area in like little baggies and like we know once those cardinals will like spin it around to the other person. <laughs> <laughs> so. But it's, it's like the bag is usually like white pillowcase bag, so it's like Christmas. You're like, when am I gonna pull out? You know, and sometimes you get bit. That's one of the funnest parts of my job, though. I love bird banding. It's, it's having the birds in my hand. It really creates that connection with the birds, and that's how we find we get a lot of people passionate about birds and helping birds and wanting to do a lot with bird conservation because they actually come to our park, they see the birds, they see the work we do, and they come to banding and they get to like hold the bird or touch the bird or release the bird, and then you know once you have a bird in your hand, you're you're hooked. And you can see how brilliant the feathers are. Oh, you can see so, yeah, you can see a lot of details up close that you can't see just by looking at, the, at them in the field. Mm -hmm. So, and then we'll look, uh, like for example, to tell if a bird is a male or female, we'll blow on their feathers and they'll blow their feathers away from their belly. And females, when they're nesting, will lose their belly feathers. They'll be just bare belly to make that skin to egg or skin to chick contact to keep them warm. And so it'll be like just uh, bare belly um, and then it'll get really engorged with fluid and stuff. And then when the babies are grown and fledged, then it starts to dry up and wrink get wrink all wrinkled. And then the feathers will come back in the off season. And then the males, um, their, their vent area, their, their cloaca will become engorged. Like a, it looks like a swollen Cheerio. Uh, it basically just swells up uh, when they're actively breeding. And so that's how we can tell if it's a boy or a girl. Uh, sometimes we can't, sometimes it's just like, it's, it's a you, it's, it's an unknown. You know? uh, but, so sometimes we can tell by plumage, like the feathers, but sometimes we can't. So, and birds don't carry ID cards, so <coughs> it'd be nice if they did. They should. They, should. they don't have pockets, so it's, <laughs> I don't speak birds, so I can't really know. What about backpacks? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Well, we are putting backpack type things on birds, so maybe, maybe we're onto something there. So. Um, Does anybody check into an idea that, like a, a cell phone signal? Uh, so some of the tags that we put on, like researchers put on birds, are kind of like cell phone technology. Uh, the problem is it's really expensive. So like some of them are a couple hundred dollars. So imagine trying to put a couple a couple hundred dollar bills on a bird and just like, okay, bye, good luck. <laughs> like not a lot of researchers have that kind of money because then that bird could fly off and then get snagged by a hawk or yeah. eaten by something else and then there's a couple hundred dollars. So. Hey, the government took Pokemon. <laughs> right. The It, there's a lot of cool technology out there um, these days, and so, some of the some of the little the tracker tags, the, the radio signals, um, some of them will last like a couple days, some of them will last like a couple of weeks, some some months. Some of them have like solar panel technology where like they recharge their battery based on like uh, solar power, and it's a lot of cool stuff out there. But it's also really expensive and, and yeah, very small stuff. Is there any way, like for us to, on your website, to look at some of the data or tracking, or is that just um, right now we don't have any of like links to the data? But um, usually, when we have banding sessions, we will post like we caught this many birds and the, the varieties of them, or like if we find an interesting case where like we had a recapture from like seven years ago. Or like when we had that recapture of the owl off in Canada, like we posted stuff like that. Um, 
But if anyone is ever interested, they could always contact us and we'd be glad to look it up in the data. But yeah, our, our, ma our master band or uh, permit holder is the one that kind of has all that access to the data and I'm getting the data access, but I have to not click it, but I could ask. You know. Okay. It's easy enough to look up. Yeah. yeah. It's just a lot of people probably aren't really interested in it, so it's, you don't really necessarily put it out there, but if people ask. It's not like top secret information, you know. It's not like we have like spy birds out there, like working for go the government. You sure about that? <laughs> yeah, birds aren't real, you know. They're just, they're just robots. <laughs> yeah, they're they're just drones, you know, yeah. spying on everyone. Um, I always like cringe when I see those birds aren't real. It looks amazing with the toy that you've got the bird dog. Yeah, it, it's real. it's a lot of work. Most days don't feel like work to me. Like I, I, I always say I have one of the best jobs in the world because I get paid to hike and be outside and get my hands dirty and teach people and play with birds and wildlife and you know. So it's pretty nice. I do have to do computer stuff. stuck with the idea of a bird wearing a backpack. I know, right? <laughs> I know. I want to see pictures. I want to see pictures. <laughs> I, wonder I, I wonder if I could Google, like, you, know, I think I might you could probably Google, like, either. like backpack trackers and stuff on birds, and you'll probably see people, researchers, post photos. It's the backpacks themselves, basically that elastic string that people, kids use for bracelets, like, magic bands or whatever they're called. It's like clear plastic uh, elastic bands. That's what researchers use. They use that clear stretchy band to make like little loops, like harnesses, harness loops. And then they put like this really expensive geo tracker um, thing with a little like wire antenna. And then they just slip it over the one bird's leg and then the other leg and their wings. And it's kind of like, you see this little wire sticking out of their feathers. and. It doesn't hinder the birds at all. Um, if you do it correctly, it doesn't hinder the birds. There was a uh, documentary. This guy had uh, put a sort of like a GoPro camera on mm -hmm. the back of a peregrine falcon oh, yeah, those, last year those are on cool. TV. Yeah, it was absolutely amazing. Yeah, those I, I've I've watched the falcons in the Smokies by Alan Cade before, and it's just fascinating to watch them. And this, people are like. As a birder, like I knew what was happening, but there were a lot of people picnicking like on, in the cave area that had no idea that there was a peregrine falcon that had just like killed a blue jay and was eating it up above them and like feathers were like coming down over it. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, we, we were like trying to like figure like catch the feathers and like see what it was. And people were like, what are you doing? And we're like, we're just looking at feathers. Like we don't want to ruin your lunch, but the falcon's eating is that falcon that we used to live in it, it came every year at the Hilton it lived in the Hilton sign down in Knoxville in downtown Knoxville it lived in the O and it came every year and that's wow. it nested at the O of the Hilton wow. yeah there, there were well the, the last time I went to the Smoky Alan Cave last spring there were two or three peregrine falcons all around the Alan Cave area and it was they were they had a nest programs just about every week uh, every week if, if I'm not doing a program one of our other rangers is so every week or weekend we've got programs that we'll do guided hikes we'll do my co-worker has more patience than I do she'll do really cool ones like maple syrup demonstrations how to make your own maple syrup or how to make your own acorn flour or how to dye Easter eggs with natural dyes and elderberry syrup she's got more she, she does some cool stuff like that. I do mainly bird walks and plant hikes and kid programs. Um, so we get, we get a lot of field trips. Uh, we had 33 kids yesterday from Sevierville Intermediate. Uh, they were fifth graders that came and took them for a hike, wore them out, put them on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> Parents are very happy.
happy when the kids come to our park because we wear them out. They're like, we're, we're going to go on a one to two mile hike. never know what to expect. I mean, I can have some expectations, but, you know, some some days a, a, a migratory bird will come by and I get really excited about that. Or, like today, I was walking my dog and I heard a black hole warbler. And I was like, it's a black hole warbler. I, like, texted my coworkers and we all got really excited. Or I'll see a new flower blooming and I get really excited. And it's the little things that I get excited about. But um, when you're a ranger, you get excited about weird stuff. Though. Or, like, fungus. Do you get any large birds? The largest bird we have is probably either the bald eagle or the great blue herons. Yeah, yeah those are the, the great blue herons nest on or right next to our island. There's a rookery of like mm -hmm. stick nests up in the top. So the great blue herons are year round and then the bald eagles, you'll see them uh, a lot more often now actually. We've been seeing at least two adults and a juvenile I leave the gym, I like look at them and I'm like, the light turns green and then I forget it. We've got a bald eagle in Gatlinburg right as you go in. There's a little city park to the right. Yeah. And uh, most of the time there's just one. Yeah. But sometimes there's two over there and that's a really great place to see them. Cool. Yeah. I, I get really uh, passionate about like the birds of prey because we get a northern harrier hawk that comes in the winter and it just flies over the fields hunting and it's really cool to see that. But we've got lots of hawks, um, osprey. You'll see osprey fishing in the river um, throughout the summers and stuff. But we, we had a great egret, I think it was. I think it was a great egret just randomly come by and spend some time at our ponds. Um, so you would have to look at my book and Harry. Oh, nice. Yeah, we see him wandering the river. Nice. So, yeah, when, usually when there's like a rare bird sighting, like, the birders know because they like share that information on eBird and it's like <laughs> when I see random birders just like showing up like in flocks I'm like y'all are what are y'all here for? Yeah. So you said it, what's the one that stands like in the creek? The tall the one? Herons, probably. Okay. Yeah. So ha I've been here a long time and I don't remember seeing those when I was little. Have they been here forever? They they basically their numbers have really increased. Yeah. Uh, because a lot of um, legislation has protected them now from uh, a lot of them I think were being poisoned by uh, lead shot from duck hunters and so there's a lot more regulations now with um, the ammunition that hunters can use and there's a stricter regulations on companies with the you know what they're polluting the waterways with and um, other pesticides as well DDT was a big deal in the 60s um, like a lots of birds of prey, like especially eagles, were having drastic population declines because the the DDT chemical was basically infiltrating fish, which were then were being eaten by the eagles and other birds of prey, and it was making their eggshells so brittle that basically the parents were crushing their babies uh, because their eggshells were so brittle. But then a lot of when they track back what was the root cause of all this then they put more regulations in for the pesticide and a lot more bird conservation efforts have really helped birds of all different types of species so. but yeah there, there's more herons these days than ever before so just like there's more bluebirds now than ever before the bluebirds uh were in sharp decline for a number of decades because they're they're cavity nesters, so naturally they would nest in like a, an old woodpecker hole or a rotted out hole in a tree or a fence post. Well, for once the chainsaw came about, lots of people were using chainsaws to cut down dead trees because they didn't want dead trees on their property or things like that. So all, all, all those natural cavities were disappearing, and so bluebirds were having a hard time finding 
cavities to nest in, so their population yeah. numbers drop. And then uh, you had conservation groups like different bluebird societies forming and then making artificial boxes, like bluebird nest boxes, and putting them up all over, and then they were basically then helping the population come back. And now bluebirds are one of the most abundant species in yeah, North America. Babies. We have bluebird babies. They're so pretty. They're so cute. Yes. Well, we actually have through our banding data uh, a cute little like story where we were able to we caught a a female and a male in the net at the same time and we banded them and they were using a nest box near one of our fields and then we actually through cameras we were able to take uh, see them going into the nest box and then they had a they had a little clutch of babies. Well then. They, they were caught again in one of our nets with their baby, and so we banded the baby, and then we've recaptured the mom and the babies before, you know, since then, but we've been catching her with a different male. Like, we caught her with an unbanded male, and so, yeah. <laughs> so then, so then we, we got, basically, she had another clutch of babies the next year with a different male. And then I think something happened to him, and then we've actually caught her in the nest box with more babies and another male. So the last one, I think, we called him 007 because his band ended in 007. So I can't remember what the, the female's number is, but we've got this like story that played out like this female, was, she made it like three, four years in a row having babies with a different dad every year, which is not typical. Typically, they are monogamous, like bluebirds will mate for life. It's just something kept happening with their mates. <laughs> but, so, but we were able to see that based on the banding data and, and our nest box monitoring data. Because we, we have probably close to 100 nest boxes through the park, and we monitor those every week. We have volunteers that help us check them. Plus, you know, who doesn't want to go up to a bluebird box and see baby birds? And we, we take them out and band them when they're a certain number of days old, and they'll still, like, it's fun to hold little baby birds in your hand and a little bracelet. Uh, last time, then, so wouldn't hurt them to go up and look in no, the box. No. We, like I said, I no. love to get something. Yeah, no, if, if you have a nest box at home that's got a nest in it, if you want to, like, open it up quick, quick, and close it up, like, that's not going to harm the birds. Now, if you did it, like, every hour, like, <laughs> you'd probably annoy the birds and, but like if you did it like once every couple days, like or once a week, it's not going to harm the birds. Well, do they eat do that? Do they, do they eat live worms? Yeah. Or do you have mealworms? Yeah, they'll eat mealworms. Uh, this time of year, the the favorite food source is caterpillars. Caterpillars are very uh, nutritious and protein packed for birds. And so most birds don't eat worms, like the earthworms and so like robins will. But like most birds are actually looking for caterpillars and other insects. Well, very good. Um, any final questions? I'm on any time. I'm there every week. All right, well, thank you very, very much. much.